Now, for what I'm sure will be the second best panel discussion uh, of our summit, I want to introduce Professor Doug Adams. Doug is an associate provost and distinguished professor of civil and environmental engineering and mechanical engineering here at Vanderbilt University. He has graciously volunteered to moderate our last panel of the day entitled Trends and Threats Shaping the Future of Cyber Education. To fill out our panel, we are very proud to have representatives from all of the service academies as well as the U.S. Army War College. Now, when I first took a look at this topic and I started to view it through a, a personal lens, I'm really amazed by what has transpired in such a relatively short period of time. My class at the United States Air Force Academy was the last class to enter the institution without computers. So every class after mine was either issued a computer by the academy or they brought their, their own with them. I distinctly remember the academy installing the first local area network and running all the wires and then being told, you know, you're going to be able to talk to somebody on the other side of the campus in real time and being blown away by that. Our cyber education at that point consisted of a single class where we learned some very basic computer programming in a small computer room in the basement of the academic building. I did not own a computer until I was 27 years old. In 2008, if you'd asked me to spell cyber and spotted me the C and the Y, I probably would have failed. Now, I tell those stories not to reinforce how old I am. That's a bit self-evident. I tell those stories because within one career, over the course of just a couple decades, we've evolved from what I just described to being dependent upon this digital domain to not only perform our traditional military activities, in the air, land, sea, and even space, but to understand that this domain offers warfighting capabilities in and of itself. In my opinion, this domain is the critical one when it comes to preventing conflict and fighting and winning should war become unavoidable. In 21st century warfare, I would suggest the digital bit in many ways has become more powerful than the ballistic missile. So the obvious question is, how do we prepare our warfighters of today and tomorrow to succeed in this environment? And due to digital convergence, with more and more of what we do and how we live being dependent upon the digital space, the same question can be asked of the civilian populace. Well, it obviously must begin with a proper approach to cyber education at all levels of academia. So now to explore this critical topic, I want to turn the mic over to Professor Adams in the panel. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have these incredible panelists here. They, they don't just educate the next generation. They're serving the country. Uh, and, and again, just really appreciate each and every one of you making this trip and participating today. So we need to get on, this, on with this, because in the time that it took me to say that short introduction, uh, 40 websites were hacked. <laughs> So this is a really critical topic uh, for, for all of us, and I just want to spend a second to introduce to my left, uh, Colonel Chad Bates. He represents the U.S. Army War College, uh, PhD and Associate Professor in the Center for Strategic Leadership. Thank you, Chad. Captain Joseph Bennon, uh, U.S. Coast Guard Academy, a PhD and a PE, and a Professor of Electrical Engineering and Cyber Systems. Professor Gene Blair, uh, U.S. Military Academy, uh, also PhD and Distinguished Professor for Innovation and Professor of Computer Science. Thank you, Gene. Uh, Colonel Judd Dressler from the U.S. Air Force Academy, the PhD and, and Permanent Professor and Head of the Department of Computer and Cyber Sciences. Uh, Commander Ike Stutz, and don't worry, Ike, I won't reveal your call sign. Appreciate that. Uh, U.S. Naval Academy, PhD and permanent military professor and chair of the cyber science department. Again, just thank you so much. We had such an incredible conversation getting ready for this panel, and I just can't wait for you to hear, hear the panelists. So let's start with the speed of innovation. So I remember sitting with General Murray at the Army Futures Command 
and he talked about the speed of war. And when we were preparing for this panel and talking about it on that Zoom meeting, that's what kept occurring to me, is just how quickly cyber innovations are happening. Uh, of course, it only seems appropriate we start with a little bit of conversation about generative AI because it's on everybody's minds. Uh, I think it's on your minds as well, uh, tools like Chat 4.0 and, and BARD and others. So here's a question to break the ice. There's been a lot of talk about how dangerous tools like these can be, how powerful, how much good they can do. Uh, and in education in particular, there's been talk about how students should be weary of them and think of them as a tool for cheating, how professors should worry about their job security uh, in a few years. So here's the question. Uh, how should we set students up for success? The cadets, the midshipmen, the officers, how do we set people up for success in this environment where we have a tool that is incredibly powerful, but also we don't quite understand? So I think I'll just ask uh, Judd, do you want to take a stab at that question? Um, I would say to uh, start off, um, ChatGPT took the academic community a little by, by surprise. Um, so uh, we, we were a little reactive. Um, kind of initial take is they can't use it. Just close it off. Right? Making sure students can't use it, they can't cheat. That's not the right mentality, right? I mean, this is an, uh, an amazing tool um, that, that they're going to they're gonna be able to utilize for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, so at the Air Force Academy, we did not block it. Okay? Um, we actually left it up to each individual instructor on, on how to use it within their classroom. Um, so um, if you don't know what ChatGBT is, um, really it's... Uh, it, it's a program that, that takes in massive amounts of data and then creates things based on the, the, the kind of prompt that you give it. Sometimes it is, uh, it's great, right? Sometimes it creates exactly what you want it to. Um, other times it, it, uh, it, it gives you bad information, it gives you bad intel. Um, as far as the cadets go, this, this can be an amazing tool for them going forward, right? Um, one, they can use it for Generating new ideas, right? Things that they weren't able to think of, um, new concepts, new scenarios, um, able to grab data quickly for them and, and really be able to ingest it. But they have to also know those dangers. Um, every one of these, these tools is really only as good as the data that it's presented, right? It's only as good as the data that it's trained on. So the data that it ingests is still full of uh, potential errors, potential biases, Right, that they have to be aware of and um, really understand in order to go, right? In order to make sure it is actually a useful tool for them. Judd, thanks very much. So Ike, when we talked in preparation for today, you were talking about some of those dangers, some of the, I guess, some of the concerns around these tools. Do you want to speak to the U.S. Naval Academy and how you're thinking about these tools? Yeah, so uh, Frank uh, answer, it is blocked at the Naval Academy right now on the Naval Academy network. Uh, now, for those of you that speak cyber a little bit, realize that just because it's blocked on the Naval Academy network does not mean it is blocked on your personal cell phone. So, um, but we, by, by default, our midshipmen are not allowed to use it unless they get express uh, permission from their professor, but the default is blocked. Um, and so I think that's a, I understand why we, we did that. I think that you need to understand the pedagogical uh, application of that kind of technology. Um, and uh, with, you know, when it hits in the middle of a semester and you have assignments written uh, with a certain way, you need to think through um, how that would impact that assignment. Um, you know, ChatGPT is pretty good at answering short response, free response, um, 600 words or less. Uh, not necessarily great at throwing together a 2,000 word essay. There's ways to do it, um, but uh, some of them just will say exceeds word count, can't do it. Um, so understanding all of that, um, I, I did something with, one, with my class just last week, that, or they turned in their papers uh, Tuesday night. Um, I said the assignment was, it had been publicized at the beginning of the semester, 2,000 to 2,500 words on what you learned on social engineering and human factors in cyber. Uh, this semester, research it, write it, provide your references, and I'll provide extra credit if you go do chat GPT and give me a paper that meets the same dynamics, or the same standards. Um, 
because I thought it was incredibly important. I uh, wanted to be aligned with the Naval Academy once, but I also want them to understand what's under the hood of ChatGPT. Um, it, like Judd said, it can, it can give you information. It can give you bad information. Um, and if that's all you're getting your information from, then it can form your opinions for you. Um, and, it, and if it's an opinion paper, that's, that's uh, not a great place to be. I got some great responses from my students. I didn't expect to get responses from my students on it. I expected the ones that wanted extra credit to take advantage of the extra credit opportunity. But uh, overnight, I got some pretty lengthy emails like, hey, sir, this was pretty cool. I didn't know that it was gonna do this. And oh, by the way, what it gave me wasn't great. Um, uh, or I learned this or I learned that. So I think it was a good exercise. I think that's the things that as an institution, we're gonna have to start embracing. Uh, we, can't, we can't give it, uh, we can't ignore it certainly, um, and we need to figure out how we can leverage it. And in our uh, majors, um, the other thing that it will impact is, is programming. Um, you know, programming language uh, clicks at different times for different students. Um, and I think you could use it as a way to ask it to, to, to do something in a programming language. And then you've got to compile it and you've got to see if it does what it's supposed to do. If it doesn't, you still got to have that knowledge to be able to go and troubleshoot and fix it. Um, but I, I I see how it could help a student who's struggling uh, with learning a new language um, to, to get them stepping in the right direction. Uh, so that, that's generally our take on it. I, I was pretty pleased with what we were able to do as a class to learn a little bit about it and, and how it, the goods and bads of it. So. No, thank you. That's, that's great. So the, another thing we talked about preparing for today was how the speed of innovation with, with cyber tools, like the ones that Ike was just describing, is very rapid, but all of our processes in the educational community aren't so rapid. So think about accreditation, something we all work through and with, the accreditation process. Uh, it's a six-year cycle, typically. Uh, and, and so if you think about every six years, you see change potentially from an accreditation standpoint, but we're seeing changes daily in these tools. So Gene, I wanted you to speak to this because, of course, you've led in the computational area uh, in the community national accreditation uh, standards and the implementation of those standards. So do you want to field this question? I'd be glad to. Um, so, so we're fortunate that computing, ha the very nature of computing is that it is always uh, advancing at an unprecedented rate, which means it gets faster and faster, how um, it's, it's advancements. And so we're, we're kind of used to that kind of thing. Uh, and then let's take a look at what the accreditation is really about. Accreditation comes in and it looks to see if a program has the right principles, the right processes, that they're taking care of their students. Uh, it, it will have something in the criteria like up-to-date curriculum and tools and practices and things like that. And so the accreditation team comes in and they, sees that, they see that the program um, they have it, they understand it, that they're, they're doing things, and it's, it's a matter of trust. Mm -hmm. that, that when we see that the program is, is up to date and doing this kind of thing, then we're, we're pretty confident that they'll be able to keep that up. And so we think that six years is about right. If there's a, a partial finding, then we might say, okay, we, we'll come back in a couple years and look again because you, you don't quite have the strength in this one area or something like that. So, so Gene, it, go, go ahead. Off front go on ahead. that, Please. a key tenant of all accreditation is continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And so even though the visit might be every six years, they're looking for artifacts and evidence that you're continuously evaluating what you're doing, how you're doing it, and doing it the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that when it comes to you know, key tools, I think a big piece of that is leveraging partnerships uh, like Clark.Center, uh, which the NSA sponsors, Seed Labs, uh, the NSF sponsors, you know, there's great resources that are out there that allow things to stay current. One of the big benefits of the service academies is that a large portion of the faculty just came off of an operational tour and they're bringing back relevant experience and tools they're using there, uh, as well as the relevancy of what we're doing and what our graduates are gonna be doing. So we can imbue our curriculum with what they're gonna see on day one or perhaps during an internship. Super excited, uh, the Coast Guard Academy has our first internship with CISA happening, uh, he's reporting on Monday. So we leverage these opportunities to, to work with others to ensure that we're continuously improving, you know, staying on the cutting edge, and then the accreditation process every six years just verifies that, that that's being done. Yeah, so what, when I think about continuous improvement, I think about the fact that you know, the six years is about right and that there's a trust factor. And then I think about some of the commentary, Ike, that you made. Uh, something that also came up in our call was like the ethics of these tools. 
And certainly that is a high priority for accreditation boards as they look at curricula, right, to, to ensure that ethics is kind of imbued in what it is we're teaching. So I'm interested from a, from a war college standpoint, uh, just what, what are you thinking about these tools, Dave, but also kind of how does ethics uh, work its way into how you present these tools as, as you do training beyond the academies? Well, well first of all, why not? The, there's a difference between um, the student body here, and it's really good for, for the educator. It's like, over here, all their students are those bright eyes, rosy cheeks, young <laughs> academics that are just beginning their future career. At the Army War College, I get um, officers with 20 years of experience have been forged and tempered by those experiences, especially over the past 20 years of being in war. Um, and so they're starting their, most of them are starting their strategic education. They're gonna be, for the you know civilians, they're gonna be the CEOs, the COOs, the CFOs, and the CISOs of these large organizations. And it's very selective to get into the Army War College. All these people will be, uh, they're in the War College, will be future senior leaders in the Army uh, or, or the Department of Defense. So they're coming in of 20 years as a professional officer. So it's like when you have an education program for specifically focused on a profession, then everything is in context to the profession. And we were the, you know, being an officer for these many years, we live the Army values, and ethics is all that. So now it's an exploratory learning objective, like chat GPT. Hey, what does it can do for you? Oh, now it's time to educate you in your profession of, well, a lot of AI is biased. How do you train AI? Now, what's the, 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 the test case and everything else, but how would you utilize it? Taking your experience and being educated at it. So now this is a tool to provide them in context of their profession. It's just like if you're a medical um, hospital person like over here, I'm gonna tr yeah, educate you in a different way than what we do at the Army War College um, because it's our profession. So you know, it's based on ethics, it's based on exploring these new tools, but how will they apply to your profession? Mm -hmm. So that's how we do that. And it's, bringing in feedback from those individuals and then and incorporating them to a lot of electives but also in-class discussions. Yeah, no, that's great. And thank you for the quick summary about War College and how you complement the other, the other panelists here, Dave. That's, that's terrific. Uh, okay, wanted to move to another topic. Uh, and and I, I was thinking about, again, our conversation and we were talking about how pervasive software is. Uh, but then I was also thinking about a lot of the discussions this morning and how a lot of them focused on the human, the human in the loop. Uh, and so I, I wanted to kind of see if you could speak to, as, you, as you're educating and training, right? It's not just the software, although the software and the technology is, is important and, and relevant. It's what that software does, right, under the control of, of a human, of a, of a service member. And so, I wanted to just turn to everybody here who's attending in the audience just for a second and ask, can I have a show of hands? How many of you feel like your password hygiene is at a very high, excellent level? Like on a scale from one to 10, 10 being excellent, how many people have above a nine? Okay, so you can see how important it is that we have this panel about education and training. <laughs> Let the record show for those of you online that we need some help here, uh, and we appreciate the honesty of the folks in attendance. So let me throw this question out to the panelists. How are you helping students at the academies understand that you know, it's, it's not just technology, it's not just something they're learning about, that they're a part of the equation too, uh, in terms of cybersecurity in particular? So, Joe, I was going to field that one to you first and see what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the technology's there to serve us. We're not there to serve the technology. And I think that the, the key is that as you go through the curriculum, we try to allow the cadets to have flexibility to pursue areas that are going to best develop them and allow them to, you know, sort of achieve both our goals and their goals. And so I think that, you know, the Coast Guard Academy, particularly with our cyber major, there's kind of four components to it. And so the first component uh, is the core curriculum that tries to develop the whole person. So again, you know, focus on kind of what makes you an educated person. And I think we really distinguish learning as both education and training, right? Training is gonna allow you to do things to contribute today uh, and learn the current tools, 
but education is gonna form your mind to be able to be relevant and effective and resilient in the future and to the unknown. And so I think that by having that mindset, it really allows our students to be able to uh, recognize the importance of their place in this design cycle, that they're both developing it, but they're also the users. And, and so I think when you go to our second component of our major, which is the, the strong technical foundation, if you're talking about cyber, you need to know something about the technology. I, I think that uh, you know, anytime you're managing something, the more you know about it, the more effective you can be. Then the third part of it is our, our balanced managerial emphasis, which again, really brings in that human piece. We look at, we have a class called Information Technology Organizations, mm -hmm. uh, System Analysis and Design, uh, and so the cyber risk management. So these courses really allow the students to examine how are people using technology and how can technology be used to make their life easier. And then the last, the fourth board, more effective, more efficient, uh, and the last piece of it, it really allows the students to pick their path. And that's the customization part where they pick what they want for their major electives, free electives, and their capstone project. And so I think by giving students the flexibility and having them directly involved in their education, they then position themselves to best utilize and understand their importance and the human element and dynamic of the technology. Yeah, and that's really our approach. Yeah, give them ownership of their education. That, that makes complete sense. Judd, what are your thoughts on this, the human in the loop? Um, so a lot of times in our kind of domain, we focus on those tools, right? We focus on the techniques. Um, so I've run the Air Force's Advanced Cyber Schoolhouse. Um, I've also run an operational squadron. And, and what I always kind of start with is that, that that tool is not the weapon system. The human being is the weapon system in the cyber domain. Mm -hmm. um, so I focus them right then and there that, that the human being is that element. Um, and then we, we really kind of stress to them throughout the entire curriculum is, is across any domain of warfare, right? It, it's not necessarily about the weapon system. It, it is about everything in warfare is an influence operation, right? We are trying to influence that, that senior leader, um, you know, who's on the other side of the, the, the battlefield to do what we want them to do, right? Cyber is a key piece of that, but in the end, it, it's, a, it's a human problem. It's a human process. Um, so we, we constantly interweave that throughout the, the course um, of curriculum um, at the academy, and we really focus on how do we, how do we, to a certain extent, humanize right, the process. So as we work through, we'll teach them the tools and techniques, but um, we actually finalize our, uh, our cyber science curriculum with a course called Cyber Operations. And so we teach um, cyber, our national level strategy, policy, law, ethics, and then we teach them how, do, how does the Air Force plan and integrate cyber operations into the air, land, sea, space domains? Mm -hmm. um, and how do they coordinate together? And then the cadets actually have to work in teams of three to five mm -hmm. um, throughout the rest of the school year, and they actually conduct cyber operations. Mm -hmm. And throughout that process, we talk, they have to actually plan it based on the strategy, based on the policy, based on the tools they've been given. But it's, it's all in the, the end goal is you know, trying to achieve that objective of changing that, that decision maker's behavior. Um, and also combined with the, essentially the, the timing and tempo of the combatant commander that you're working for. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's all kind of bringing them back together that, that it's not just a technology problem, right? Um, we're not teaching them uh, those skills and techniques just to, just to be able to do that within the cyber domain. Yeah. It is a larger people problem, um, even in uh, the concept of warfare in the cyber domain. So yeah, Judd, so you, you said the word domain several times and you listed out the domains. And so we've got obviously the Navy here represented, we've got the Air Force, the Coast Guard. I don't know, we got the Army represented twice, so I guess, way to go <laughs> Army. <laughs> Super cover. Uh, I'm a cyber officer, so okay. I'm a cyber domain. Okay, <laughs> so, okay. so you, you stole my thunder because that was gonna be my question to throw yeah, out here. here. So where is, so we've got the Space Force. One of the questions from the audience that I'm looking at here on my phone, not doing email, by the way, <laughs> is, is okay, we, we've got all these domains represented. Sh is there gonna be, should there be a cyber force, right? We have the space force. So what, what are, th any thoughts on that? Yes, there should, and it should be under the Coast Guard, just like the Marines. <laughs> the, uh, and I'll say that primarily because of authorities, right? Technology doesn't have authorities. Okay, maybe AI, when it gets first amendment rights, it's gonna get authorities, but right now it doesn't. But the Coast Guard is, you know, national defense, it's regulation, it's part of the intelligence community, it's law enforcement, and it's humanitarian. I think that's what you want for your cyber force. So, so Gene, I'm curious, uh, I'm curious, Gene, if you're on a peer review panel, 
and you're reading Joe's concept paper <laughs> for why it is that cyber should be, the epicenter of cyber should be the US Coast Guard. I guess, what kind of grade do you give that proposal? Well, let me ask chat GPT and see what it says. <laughs> <laughs> there are teachers that are actually doing that, that are asking chat GPT, what grade should I give this? this hmm. um, so. Hmm. Um, Gene, are you dodging the question? I am. <laughs> Anybody as a, else? As a real educator, she has to read it before she grades it. <laughs> uh, all right. So any other thoughts uh, from, let's say, the other services about other strategies, other options for where cyber command should be located or if there should be one at all? Well, I, I spent 18, of my, 18 years of my career as a helicopter pilot. And I can, I can tell you absolutely, when I got to my first squadron, I was cyber dumb. Um, no concept of why I was being told to do certain things as a Lieutenant JG that, that you know, ultimately were mitigations for uh, thumb drive vulnerabilities and all of that kind of stuff. I think we absolutely do need a cyber force. Um, one of the things uh, for our academy um, that we do is, is we do assess people into cyber warfare billets, um, cyber warfare engineers, cyber focused billets. And you would think that most of those come from the cyber operations major um, that, I, that I oversee, and that is not the case. Um, many do. Some come from computer science, some come from computer uh, engineering, electrical engineering. Um, but the majority of my majors are going to go out to the fleet. Uh, they're going to fly airplanes, drive ships, submarines, and be marine. Um, and those units are going to benefit because they had a cyber education um, and were uh, exposed to certain things at the academy um, that uh, whether they were a cyber operations major or not. But ultimately, you're gonna need people. Um, the, the phrase we use, and I know that other service academies use it as well, is the all many few approach. All of our students are gonna get a baseline in cyber. At the Naval Academy, you get two cyber classes, even if you're an English major, right? Um, one's your freshman year, one's your junior year. That's the all. The many, there are gonna be other opportunities. Um, many of the people you've heard um, speak at this conference, they live in close proximity to the Naval Academy, and, mm -hmm. uh, and we have them come and visit and, and talk to our midshipmen. And then there's the few, the ones that focus in on those majors that I just mentioned. Um, those are the ones that are going to go do those cyber-focused things. Um, but uh, I, yes, you need a cyber force, absolutely. Can I add to that, Absolutely, please? Gene. So, so uh, just, just building on the, the many, or everybody, many and few, idea. The, the vulnerabilities that come in with uh, cyber and, and cybersecurity come from mostly the many, but not completely. And so I'd like to build on the skills that we teach our, our students so that they go out and they be good officers. They, we also teach them the, the team working skills to be able to work with people from other disciplines. And we teach them a lot of leadership, as you might expect. And so it's our officers that go out there, whether they're going into the infantry as a computer science major or they're going into the armor as a cyber science major, whatever it is, but they're there to lead their soldiers and that's part of what we need them to do is to understand the, the risks and threats that are out there so that they can inspire their soldiers to be safe and have those strong passwords if you want to talk about that. Very good. So, I mean, uh, I've done a lot of research on this. Mm -hmm. um, and because the Army started a cyber branch, and it's like eight years old now, so there's a lot of data that I've been collecting and researching on. And, and at, the, at the end of the day, and, and Mr. Marlowe was talking about that when he's on the fireside chat, and, and looking at the commercial, you know, like um, on the commercial side and also in the military, um, you know, Google and Apple, they have a hard time retaining, retaining their top talent. Mm -hmm. And it really comes down to the services are great at educating and training people. We give them exquisite skills. They, they, they get their education, then they join the service, and they get, in the cyber realm, they get phenomenal training. I mean, we spend up around 300 k over those, of the six years that they're serving, making them highly marketable, so it's hard to retain them. But at the end of the day, well, there's three things, and I call it like the, like the three stool thing, like your talent's on top. They want a mission and a purpose. You know, the mission that we have is like, hey, you can be a nation state hacker, or you're going to have some really cool things you're going to do in cyber. Two, 
They want to continuously improve their trade craft. They're right there. That's great. It's like, I want to do something that resonates with me. Two, I always want to improve. And the last one is, I just want to be recognized and compensated for my work. And it's like a three-legged stool. You start wearing away, when, sooner or later, one of those legs is going to fall over and you lose the talent. Mm -hmm. Apple and Google, they can pay a lot of money, but they still lose the talent because people are like, this doesn't resonate with me, this mission. So if we cannot do that in the services and keep them on it, because the thing is, like, I want to do my mission, and I hate everything that takes me away from doing that mission. Mm -hmm. If we can't do that in the services, we're going to lose the talent because at the, the end of the day, the problem set is, what I'm concerned about is China and Russia, they train and give a lot of experience to their people, but they can retain them either by coercion or, or other reasons. Us, we have a free society. You serve your commitment, you can leave. And, but at the end of the day is when we look in the future, I'm worried about having an, an experienced and mature workforce that can counter those adversaries threats. So that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, okay, how do we build a mature and experienced workforce? Certain people will, you will resonate, but in the aggregate, because quantity over quality, mm -hmm. it's like in the old Soviet days, that's the, the problems that I look at. So that, thanks, Dave. So there are two threads there I wanna pick up on that, that map into questions that I'm seeing here on my phone. Uh, so one is relative to the workforce. And so as, as we think about educating and training uh, next generation cyber warriors, clearly we're not doing that in a vacuum. So you mentioned company names, you know, Google and the like. Obviously there are companies that are behind all these generative AI tools. So th the question is what, what ways in which are you currently partnering with industry, uh, the, the companies that are creating tools and maybe what ways do you think you should be partnering that, that you're not currently? Like, what are the opportunities for partnering more with, with, uh, with industry? Because clearly, uh, we all have a stake in national security. And a lot of those websites that were being hacked a moment ago you know, weren't university websites. They were company websites. So any, any thoughts on that? Um, from an industry perspective, um, we work um, primarily uh, towards the end of our, our cadets' time. Right? We want to get them to that foundation and then give them the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll send cadets out um, on, on what we call summer summer research uh, project, which is basically an internship program. Um, and we send cadets uh, everywhere, from Google's, Microsoft's, to Palo Alto's, to NSA, NRO, um, to, to really get them that, that, that kind of industry or, or DOD experience. Um, it really gets them motivated, um, right? The, they spend three years getting essentially hit over the head with, with something new every single day. Um, so, so getting them out where they can actually then apply some of those, those tools, some of those lessons that we've taught them, um, they come back a lot more motivated. Um, they come back uh, really understanding why, they're, why we're teaching them what we're teaching them um, and uh, how it will apply potentially uh, as, they, as they enter the real world. Um, the other piece we have is uh, their senior capstone project. Mm -hmm. um, so from the beginning of the senior year to the end of the senior year, we, they work in teams of three to four uh, students on an operational problem set. Yeah. And we usually bring in, um, we have a, an operational uh, uh, POC that they can work with. Um, we also have an industry representative um, who, is, who is interested in that problem set and will work with the cadets. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that, that uh, we're always looking for, for uh, companies to work with, um, but the companies, the, the projects that work the best is when the company is fully involved, right? I, we can work and have the cadets there, um, but having that company there um, day to day working with them and, and helping them through and helping them understand the problem set um, the cadets are amazing, I promise. Um, these are some of the smartest kids you'll ever see. Um, but having somebody there that can just help them tweak what they're thinking as they go through is, is really a big deal. I'll give you an example. Um, we had a project uh, with AT&T. AT&T sent us a rep and they sat there with the cadets every other day when they met for their capstone project. Um, and AT&T wanted to be able to basically uh, say a, a hurricane took out a, the comm network um, over a base or something like that in, in Florida. Um, at t wanted to be able to roll in with a, uh, a semi-truck, throw open the back, and have a swarm of UAVs fly out that had a 5G antenna or, or Wi-Fi antenna, whatever, um, on, the, on these UAVs, and have them automatically arrange themselves to provide the network. So the cadets worked with them day to day, created the entire front end, so all they had to do was circle on the map the area that they wanted coverage. Um, the, uh, it would take into effect uh, how many you had, what the... Uh, 
what the weather was like, what the terrain was like, and, and really build in, uh, a, an AI model um, where they would constantly readjust to give you the best possible network for that area um, as possible. Um, they went further and, and made it so that the, the drones could come down and, and recharge. Um, and uh, even if you lost one, it would automatically, again, readjust um, uh, to, to give you the best possible product. Again, having that, that uh, industry experience or industry rep there at all times made that, that project uh, really incredible by the end. That's great. Yeah, great. We see the same thing, um, and, and with our internships, a lot of times that will spawn <laughs> the, the capstone idea. Mm -hmm. And so you've created that relationship the summer prior, and you roll into your, your capstone project, and, and that's um, helpful. We, we just had our capstone day yesterday at the Naval Academy, uh, and all the industry partners coming in to see these projects. Um, one of uh, one of those projects was awarded some military medals um, by a special operations group for what they created. So the, the neat thing, um, when we describe the differences between the War College and the Naval Academy, one of the things I like to say, or the War College and the Service Academies, is uh, our, our students aren't um, held back by experience. So uh, a lot of times they look at a problem differently than we would have where I'm looking at it through my 24 years of, of experience and, and, and my, with my blinders on, um, and they don't necessarily have that. Now, sometimes you'll tell them that's not going to work, right? But, but a lot of times uh, they can teach you um, something which is kind of neat. Yeah, that is neat. I, I think that experience is similar at all the service academies. I, I think back to sort of the Space Force, the concept, and answering the question, I mean, obviously there is a, a role for contractors in private sector, you know, in the military, in DHS, and in DOD. It does make you wonder, though, you know, what is an inherently governmental function? And if you had a space force in whatever instantiation it came in, would there not be members of that force doing jobs that contractors are doing today? A cyber force. Cyber force. Yeah. Sorry, so mad. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a good... It makes you wonder. Yeah. It makes you wonder. It does. Well, and that actually leads me to another question that I was thinking about for, for a few a few of you, but Gene in particular. So there's a question here. We've heard a lot today about the need to encourage well-educated young people. Again, this must be from somebody at Vanderbilt, like those here at Vanderbilt, <laughs> <laughs> to join the government workforce. So to really contribute to solutions in the area of cybersecurity, you know, to, to provide national security for the nation. So what might non-military faculty do to get students, our students, students at other civilian universities excited about this, about this discipline and what they, can, what they can do. We heard Mr. Marlowe talking earlier about kind of the ideal uh, that, that he thinks about and that CIA thinks about. And so just interested, Gene, in your thoughts about what are the types of things we can do to get students really excited about being a part of the solution in this space? I think it comes down to recognizing in the students what is their passion and what do they really care about and helping them understand how serving the country can further that more than anything else. Um, because that, that's what it's all about and that's, it's exactly what he was talking about is, are you going for pay? Mm -hmm. What is it that's gonna fulfill you and, and fulfill your life? And that's the thing to help them understand that. Yeah, so, so does, is part of that giving students great experiences, like kind of Judd was describing and working with partners, giving them an experience where they can feel what that feels like, that ability to actually contribute to a solution that, that may, might have national security ramifications? Certainly that helps a lot. And, and the, uh, the organizations like NSA and, and a bunch of the government organizations will bring students in in the summer between their maybe junior and senior year so that they get to experience what, it, what it's about. And then we're actually relying on that experience being a good experience, or I should say an accurate experience. We're not trying to fool people or, or pull the wool over their eyes or anything like that. It's to show them what it's about mm -hmm. so that they can make the, the decision if that's what's right for them. Does Vanderbilt participate in scholarship or service program? Because if not, they should because that allows you to get your students uh, tuition scholarships, and then they owe the government two years of service, and it pays it off. Uh, CAE, 
there's a national center of academic excellence community that exists. If Vanderbilt doesn't have a POA plan of study as well as a designation for that, that would be another great way to provide opportunities for your students to and those, engage. And those two years for ser of service are not in the military. They're Correct. in the government. Kind of like smart, smart graduate fellowships where they go to serve at a national laboratory in, in the DOD space. The other piece about this is, um, yes, there's a service piece, but regardless of whether you serve or not, um, in any capacity, uniform or not, ultimately this cyber domain stuff, it comes down to the human, right? And so whether you want to serve in any of those aspects or not, we need folks that understand that we can build really good secure technical solutions and we'll find a way as humans to screw it up. Um, <laughs> we will use the same password on multiple systems. We'll use bad passwords. We will, um, you know, the air gaps exist on systems and yet viruses and, and, and malware can still get to them because of the human. Um, and so, you know, back to the question earlier about um, human in the loop stuff, I think it's important to understand the role that the human plays in it. We, we all are a team player in this, whether we want to be or not. Um, and certainly in the military, um, you know, we have, in all of our careers, we have seen a shift from um, some specialization to contracting. And so a contractor comes in, we need to assume that they are cyber secure as well. Otherwise, they're bringing that vulnerability and risk to, to the service. So. So, so Ike makes me think of, a, of another question that I read here a second ago, and I've got to find it. Uh, here it is. So we talked about the human in the loop, right? The, the human who is going to be a part of the solution to develop these tools for the future uh, in cybersecurity and in other contexts. The question from the audience is, how are we integrating adversary understanding, mm -hmm. technical, cultural, political, historical, educational mm -hmm. understanding into our development of cyber curricula? So how do, we, how do we understand, we heard about blue and red forces earlier, how do we understand the red forces uh, and, and the human in the loop there and incorporate that into the curriculum? Do we do that? Is that, is that something that you all put a, okay, we've got some heads nodding, so okay, yes. Gene, kick us off and we'll go down the line here. So I'll um, just talk about the difference between perhaps, the only difference that I can truly describe between computer science and cyber science is that cyber science is in the presence of adversaries mm. and everything we teach them is in the presence of adversaries, so they need to keep it in mind. So it's, it's pervasive it's throughout. It's pervasive. Pervasive throughout. Joe? Well, I do think pedagogically it makes you wonder, you know, what is appropriate at what stage? And how much do you spend focusing on learning what you need to know before you start worrying about what others know? And so as you look through that, you know, what's at the undergraduate level, what's at the graduate level? So, so I completely agree with Gene that, you know, with cybersecurity, you're absolutely constantly aware of, you know, threats and adversaries and trying to figure out you know, how you protect what you have and your resources. And then the question then becomes, you know, what's appropriate at the undergraduate level, what be a graduate at the, at the war college level, and how do you integrate all of that? Uh, and, and we only have so much time. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question that I think you can't have a successful cybersecurity program without awareness and uh, conscious uh, activities and education in, in, the, in light of your adversaries and you can't let that become such an emphasis that you lose the core fundamental information you need to have. The Coast Guard, we have a cultural perspectives class, we have a global challenges class, and we have an intel and cyber ops class, and those classes definitely bring that in, uh, but I think there's a balance there that you just watch out for. Okay, any thoughts there? Yeah, um, that perspective is brought in. We have a cyber strategy class, cyber policy class, cyber law class, and it talks about the US policy as well as our adversary side of the house to, to kind of compare and contrast and, and what, what uh, what issues and concerns or challenges that may bring us as a society when, when we look at how, how we utilize cyber. Um, we incorporate it into our, our cyber ops class as well. The, you know, when we talk missions, we, we bring in that intel piece mm -hmm. on what an adversary can and can't do, um, what their capabilities are. Um, the other thing we do is we actually use it, um, we'll bring some cadets uh, either down to San Antonio or we'll bring them into this, uh, one of the skiffs at the academy and we'll actually give them a full threat brief. Um, a lot of times, uh, the, the main comment we get are the cadets, again, we'll usually do it as four degrees, so this freshman year. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, I never knew my, uh, well, this, this was happening um, within my country, and uh, how do I sign up? 
Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of use it a little bit as a recruiting tool too, is uh, for them to fully understand what is actually happening in the cyber domain, um, what some of the, the, the techniques and, and skills that are out there. Um, get them excited about it, and then we get some, some more majors uh, within the uh, computer and cyber science world. Ike, you were nodding your head pretty heavily earlier. Yeah, I mean, adversarial. I, absolutely, uh, Gene, Gene said exactly what I would have said. The, mm -hmm. the definition for cyber is the presence of an adversary. So, you know, our major we say is about eighty percent technical, twenty percent non-technical, mm -hmm. um, and the technical would be the things you were thinking of uh, the programming, the computer architecture, data structures, all of that kind of stuff, cryptography. Um, but the non-technical is the the strategy, the policy, uh, understanding U.S. law, international law. Um, uh, cyber, cyber law and ethics, and then a class in human factors um, on social engineering. And we, in that class uh, that I just finished up, it's, it's um, teaching our students about that human element, but then um, not only looking at it from, hey, this is the part you play, but this is what you could exploit. Mm -hmm. um, this is how they're gonna exploit it on us, this is how you could exploit it on them. And our, our senior classes fall as a, a cyber one, uh, and spring is cyber two, cyber one um, is cyber attack. So it's a, a full semester of attacking uh, in a sandbox um, targets, um, networks and all of that. Um, and then the next semester is cyber defense um, because they realize that hey, attacking may not be that hard, defending is really hard. You gotta be right every time. Um, but all of that is in the vein or in, the, uh, in mind of there's an adversary there. Uh, whether you're defending or attacking. So speaking of defending, so one of the other questions, and this is pretty specific, but are you, are you providing students with education around writing secure code, writing Absolutely. secure software? So is that, I assume, I assume that would be high on the curriculum list, yeah. so that's, that's good. Um, very good. So wanted to move to, I, I guess, a, a final topic. Uh, I think we got enough time to cover this. And you know, I think Joe, I think it's fair to say you threw out the gauntlet a while ago uh, to some extent that, <laughs> that if we have a cyber force and we should have one, it should indeed be situated within the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. And so... Oh, so it's a Marine, the Marine Corps yes. is a separate entity <laughs> yes. that's part of the Navy. I would view it as a separate entity, okay. but so with that in DHS, <laughs> on the Coast Guard. So, so, the, so we know, we've, we've heard a lot, we've read about, we know how important joint operations are, multi-domain environments, that, you know, it, especially in the age of strategic competition and the like. We also know, and I've, I know from having worked with the armed forces my whole career, that there are, I think, healthy rivalries, not just in athletics, but in almost every aspect uh, of, of, uh, of the services. So I guess what I'd like to explore is how those rivalries are making you better, mm. maybe in terms of in terms of cyber. Uh, uh, I'm going to keep going. So training. the Coast Guard Academy beat Navy the last two years <laughs> at the NSA's <laughs> National Cyber Exercise. Do you want to go there? <laughs> I'm not going. Well, I'm not. Air Force I'm not, won this and year. Well, the Air no, Force has won the last right, two years, which is yeah. fine, which is good for you. Except they have five times the student body, 140 million dollar building. You know, if he wants to go in there. So, so I think that competition Excuse. is healthy because it makes us better, right? Mm -hmm. Competition that's appropriate, and I think we all serve with the same flag, right? We all serve the same constitution, we're all swearing the same oath, right? That's the core value that unites us, and then the inner civil rivalry that allows us to have a little bit of, you know, poking fun and, and, and whatnot, leads to sharpening, you know, the sword, sharpening the spear, uh, which makes us better. And the beauty of those competitions is not only what happens during them, but what happens before and after, mm -hmm. right? The connections that are made, the relationships. I mean, we have cadets on our cyber team that routinely reach out to members of the other services cyber, cyber teams, uh, and you know, it is, it is awesome. So I think that it helps, it actually motivates yeah. and also creates relationships that are lifelong. Okay, I'm gonna come to Gene, just so I don't have to separate you two, because the height, <laughs> the height differential, I think, is about a total of six feet. <laughs> so I'm gonna go to Gene and then to Dave on this question. What, how does it make you better? Uh, what ways, are, I guess, are you competing along the lines of what Joe's saying? Uh, maybe what, what are ways in which you'd like to see more collaboration in this space? Can, can I instead talk about the collaboration that we do have? Absolutely. Um, back in about 2013, there were people from the, the Naval Academy who had this idea. And, and when they came to the ABET Summer Commission meeting, 
Um, I kind of horned my way into this conversation, and, and then we brought Hoot Gibson from the Air Force Academy together, and we started really talking about the need for cyber education and, and um, a, a definition of what it means for, to have a, uh, the skills that you need for cyber education and a need for accreditation criteria. And so what came out of that was what was called the Cyber Education Project, and it really started with a lot of members from the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, and, and West Point working together and bringing in other people across civilian schools to really figure out what it means. And it, it was a, a campaign of, of collecting all the ideas for what the skills are and, and that, and, and encapsulating that, but also getting that information out and trying to, to, to say what is it and where does this discipline belong. Mm -hmm. It was really powerful. And, and it was, um, I have to give credit to the Naval Academy for, for initiating it, but right from the start, mm -hmm. we were all involved in it and very interested in it. Fantastic. Dave, you talked earlier about uh, War College is not just about Army officers, but officers in the other forces. So how do you see collaboration as, a, as an important, vital part of where this technology is going from a national security standpoint? I mean, this is part of any education, having a diversity of thought patterns. I mean, it's like we have 285 officers, but we also have 80 international fellows. Uh, in each seminar, you have a representative from the Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, some Army. We got some, you know, sometimes somebody from the government, and usually two to three internationals. All right, so it's 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 having that rich conversation of people of experience of like this is how I look at this. It's just the U.S. You know, we we talk and we have a certain viewpoint. Um, but then when you talk to a, an international fellow from a different ally or partner country, you know, they have a different view. Um, so that's always good. But now it's just like, if you go into cyber, and exactly what Gene was talking about, the collaboration we do there, cyber is joint. Mm -hmm. If you're going into cyber and you're going to go work for uh, General Nakasone, you know, there is a lot of integration. And, and I think that the key part of that, and we're talking about that, before is the neural diversity. Mm -hmm. They train, they teach and educate people differently than what the Army does. Mm -hmm. And so you have that neural diversity and also that diversity in backgrounds, which makes our um, cyber force so effective. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that starts at the collaboration there and then it just goes into it. Because teams work it, you ha you'll have people from different services on a team, especially at the higher levels. And, and, and that's, that's a critical part because, you know, we, we feed off each other. We, we learn off of each other. So that's critical. Yeah, Dave, so there is a question specifically for you, and it's along the lines of collaboration. It says the prior panel on misinformation, I think, pointed out the knowledge gap of our federal policymakers maybe in areas that touch on cyber. So the, the question is, do you, uh, Colonel Bates, have ideas on how we might educate them or others who might not be interested in pursuing a, a full degree, a full graduate degree, but, but giving them kind of a primer, uh, a, a, uh, a basic fundamentals on cyber. So, I mean, it, it, you know, as I talked about, our, my population's different, but when you're talking about, when you're teaching executives, you know, like, as I said, I got a diverse, they're gonna be like the CEO, COs, CFOs. It's communications. And it's translating. As I like to say, it's like you have a CISO. You say, can you translate geek the strategic and strategic the geek? It's all about the communications. It's like as a CISO, and you're talking to the COO or the board, can you articulate why they need to invest more in cybersecurity? Because we'll, you know, and, and have that conversation. It's like this is how it will impact our reputation, and this is how it will impact the, the bottom line. In the military, it's the same thing. As my old boss says, the network and the data is our foundational weapon system. Hmm. So as a foundational weapon system, how do you train on it? How do you manage it and employ it in a contested environment? So that's, for us on that side, and the security is like, how do you communicate that? How do you put it in the frame of reference for those senior leaders? Mm -hmm. So that is part of the education at strategic level of, okay, this is what site, AI, AI is, um, you know, bias, it could help you, but are you gonna delegate your decision authority to a digital entity, 
Like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm like, it's like, you know, it's, it's really attentive. And it's like, why, you know, what's the, what's the thing you're going to, you're going to focus on cybersecurity because 95% of all vulnerabilities is by humans. Mm -hmm. It's just like, where do you focus your attention on? So we, they get some of that education there in the context of their profession and their senior levels. So, so turning from senior leaders to like the opposite, the, literally the opposite of the spectrum, K through 12. So we've got a question here that kind of touches on two different aspects. It's a great question. I wish we would have had more time to address it. So maybe a lightning round on this, uh, just kind of top of mind thoughts. So what can we be doing in K through 12 uh, to fill the pipeline, to strengthen the pipeline, and also to generate a more diverse body of students, not only in the academies, but across academia, who are really passionate, interested, exposed to uh, cyber technologies and, and where they can take them as an individual and how they can be a part of a solution you know, that, that helps the nation. So any thoughts on this? A, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the first things we learned as a kid, and this isn't my line, or, uh, Chris Inglis, who's on our staff, uh, says this. Um, as a kid, you learn how to, you're, you're taught how to cross the street, look left, look right, look left again and cross, right? But who showed you how to browse on the internet? When, when did you take your kid and show them how to browse before you gave them the device and said, be quiet, mm -hmm. right? I think it starts there, um, telling them how to safely browse, how to safely do things, mm -hmm. um, enabling certain things uh, on devices. That's one way. Um, and then uh, I had a, 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 an aha moment with my kids um, a while back. You know, I think all of us at this time frame have argued with our kids on how math is supposed to be done because mm -hmm. they teach new ways now, right? Um, they were teaching, teaching them base 10 and the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place. And I was like, binary, two to zero, two to the one, two to the two. You know, those kinds of things can ultimately reinforce the concepts that you're going to need in cyber later. So. So, so I'm getting the time to wrap up. But I hate the fact that you introduced this new math kind of thread, <laughs> because we could have talked about that for the whole hour like, uh, with one daughter graduating college and high school. So I definitely feel your pain on that front. So I would like to thank all of you. Great questions. Thank you so much. But also thank our panel. As I said at the outset, uh, first of all, it's a huge commitment of time and energy uh, to come here. And we just so appreciate your insights here, but really, really appreciate what you're doing uh, in the academies, in the war college, uh, train, you know, training, educating uh, the future warriors, uh, future service members, what you're doing for the nation. We really, really appreciate you. So just want to thank our panelists uh, and thank all of you.